Welcome to the Television Executives Roundtable. We're here with Nancy Dubuque of A&E Networks, Joss Apan of AMC Networks, Richard Plepler of HBO, Ted Sarandos of Netflix, Bonnie Hammer of NBC Universal. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I think we'll start with a question <coughs> for the group. Uh, a lot of you are business partners, rivals in certain sense. Uh, I'm curious, a move that someone at this table has made that has made you jealous or something you've admired, give us a, a, a little insight into how you look at each other in, in, in their business. Well, I, I would say that there's no one around this table, and this isn't false flattery, We'll that, take it. That we're, that, that, that we're not that we're not fans of um, at our place, and there's a tremendous amount of great work being done in our industry. And um, I send uh, very sincere emails uh, to everyone around this table, uh, saying bravo for good work that they do, and graciously they they do the same thing. I've always felt this. It is not a zero sum game. Everybody's doing something slightly different to elevate their brands and their businesses, and there's room for everybody to do that and do well. That doesn't mean we're not competitive. It doesn't mean that when I see a great show on AMC or I see a great show on Netflix or I see Mr. Robot or I see some great work on history that I don't say, where is that? But the truth of the matter is we concentrate on playing our game to the best of our ability. If we do that, I like our hand, and I think there's plenty of room uh, for everybody else to do good work too. And it's pretty clear that everybody here is doing great work, which is great for the industry and elevates our business. We, we've done some reinvention, you know, from DVD to the mail to licensing to producing, but to be able to pivot like really long-standing brands around a show, uh, network brands around a show, is really fantastic. And I think Unreal is a great example of that which is uh, a very meta, meta show to yeah. be able to transform uh, in the mainstream that way. Lifetime. Yeah, I'm curious if you guys think, are we past peak TV in a 400 show universe? Can, we, can everyone sort of keep playing in the scripted game? Or are we going to start seeing people retreat? I know we is an example, yeah. We certainly don't only play in the scripted game. Sure, I would say we, but we, you're pushing into, you're continuing to push into an incredibly expensive ab game. Absolutely, game. absolutely, but it's it's by design. I think there's a very specific reason, um, you know, to play in the scripted game, but only if it makes sense for the brands that mm -hmm. we have. We're not playing in the scripted game to play in a genre. We're playing in the scripted game because history has a different point of view to offer that. You know, we can tell stories that ironically are better than fiction in some ways because, yeah. you know, history has created the greatest stories of all okay. mankind. And so it makes sense for that brand to push into that space. Lifetime's always had a legacy of scripted just in the movie format, and so it makes sense for us to push beyond that. Whether or not A&E should play there long term, I think, is yet to be determined. And, you know, for us with Peak TV, brands are going to become more and more important because brands need to curate for audiences. Audiences are overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed with, with how much content is out there and, and what's being seen as a commodity versus what's being seen as premium or what's serving a purpose. The way we think about it is when we step on stage, we want to do something that is going to uh, obviously be differentiated but is going to create a kind of addictive television for a particular part of our subscriber base. So different people are going to be addicted to different things. John Oliver, obviously, huge fan base, non-script. Bill Maher, huge fan base. Bill Simmons, huge fan base. We're very excited to see what Jon Stewart uh, is is going to bring to the network, and I think everybody else uh, <laughs> yes. will be. What is that going to be? You know, it's John's voice and John's sensibility manifest through a short form and through, uh, and through different genres. But once again, it's his expression. And what all of this comes back to is, what does the artist want to do? And so we're all in the service of the sacredness of the talent. And when they come in, whether John is pitching what he's pitching right. or Bill Simmons comes in and talks about what he wants to talk about or Steven Soderbergh comes in and has an, an, an idea for extending the nick, whatever it is, we're responding to the artist's passion. Sure. That can be but scripted. But there's a price point at that. I mean, you have networks you have, you know, with Bravo and with right. E that have pushed into that, are, that had been largely unscripted That's networks. Correct. It's a whole lot cheaper to play in that game. And it is, and it, not necessarily. First of all, to answer the first part of the question, yeah. you know, is there too much TV? Have we peaked and yep. scripted? 
Um, I don't believe so. I think there's a real misconception that people aren't watching content as much as they were. And if you aggregate all the eyeballs yeah. everywhere, there's still this amazing thirst and need and desire for good content. Mm -hmm. Video consumption. The crap is going to fail. The crap is going to fall down. Which people can watch over time. Yeah. Which is very important. Yeah. That's a, you know, I, I even yeah. think the notion of, of peak TV, it's, a, it's, an, it's an analog phrase. I mean, it's really from another era when you had Four, three or four broadcast networks in three hours of prime time and not only so many hours in the day. Yeah. And everything exists in perpetuity now. So every time we put on a new show, we're competing with everything ever made. Yep. So when you think about, is there too much TV, that's a, a ridiculous mm -hmm. notion. And if it causes people not to take chances and keep taking big swings, uh, then it's a bad outcome. Mm -hmm. right? And you really, said that there, there are a lot of mediocre there shows There are a lot of mediocre shows. There. Now, and, now you know, <laughs> what is the future for those mediocre shows? Well, it's a business chat. It's a future's business. never right. good for mediocre <laughs> shows. Yeah. And it, what it's going to do is and gonna raise happen. that bar. And yeah. when we develop, yeah. when you asked if on a Bravo or an E, which hadn't had scripted, just like Nancy, which yeah. is in very smart in terms of if it's part of the brand, it's going to work. Mm -hmm. If you can get a higher um, ad dollar because it will sell more in terms of scripted yeah. than it will for reality, and it fits the brand, it's the right decision. You know, the Royals on an E or Girlfriend's Guide to Divorce, they make sense for that brand. That's Am right. I going to yeah. overdevelop just to throw some stuff on with the hope that it sticks? No. But if it's right for the brand, if it's going to elevate, mm -hmm. you know, the entire CPM, if it's if it's going to give me something else and potentially a back end, yeah. or be yeah. completely owned by Comcast because that's the route they may want to go, then it's a and win. We're, we're also yeah. in service of the audience. I mean, mm -hmm. that, not just the artist, but you know, what a, fans want to be surprised and people want to find and discover things they love that they didn't know they were going to love. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of our, our role to continuously try and sometimes we fall flat on our face when we do that. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think the, even the, the, the phrase mediocre TV, like I did, there's absolutely, we'll all agree that there's some things, but I bet we won't agree on what those things are. <laughs> So that's depending right. on well, your, ta your personal take, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Who has yeah. mediocre shows? Yeah. Totally well, you know, what Walking Dead's sort of <laughs> mediocre. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but so but the ratings are definitely but mediocre. But, that, but this again <laughs> is about the on-demand age, which is you, you can program to taste, and it becomes a business model to say, look, this show can attract this many people because this many people like that kind of thing. That's right. And, 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 and even in an advertising basis, audiences, right. then the advertisers know, I'm I'm talking to this specific right. audience who has a propensity to want this certain thing, so we can charge higher rates. Remember, we're in a slightly different business. We are not selling any advertising. Mm -hmm. right. And the monetization of an HBO show, I have people ask me all the time, tell me how you make money on Silicon Valley. Tell me how you make money on Veep. Tell me how you make money on John Oliver. We make money, if you will, on those shows because it elevates the brand right. and it draws people to HBO. And now people have optionality of how and when they want to watch those shows. Mm -hmm. I think where they led the way brilliantly was in creating a new option mm -hmm. for viewing, which uh, we have proudly followed to give our consumers all different ways to get at the product. What's interesting, they made Breaking Bad mm -hmm. a kind of phenomenon, if you will, because people were able to come to it and catch up with it. And I think the conversation around Breaking Bad elevated, right? The wire became something quite remarkable later on. Yep. It never did huge ratings right. when it was on HBO. Yep. And as HBO Go emerged, people started catching up with the wire and now people are going back and having a third run at the wire. Again, brand elevating. How do we monetize that? We monetize it because it elevates the brand, sure. which is a virtuous circle. It also brings creative talent from of the course. film side that, that all of a right. sudden television becomes the destination. Yes, of course, um, absolutely. You yes. have an example of that with Mr. Baz Luhrmann of yeah. late. And we started with one with David Fincher. You with absolutely Cards, so. did. Yeah. <laughs> Neither yeah. of whom are, uh, are have cheap visions, I will say. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's been, so this, this $120 million number came out. Um, he said recently that it's not the most expensive show ever made. Where, <laughs> what, what's right, what's wrong in all of this? And he how quickly threw the crown under the bus right yes, away. Yes, he did. Yeah. But well, he didn't actually uh. say what was. <laughs> but think? that is starting to absolutely kill us poor people here <laughs> in Basic Cable yes. because we have wonderfully talented uh -huh. producers, suppliers. Thank you. 
people like yes. Sam, who have created Mr. Robot, yes. doing a great job, who all of a sudden hear what these guys uh -huh. are paying and are coming in and going like this. Uh -huh. And if we want to keep amazing talent, all of a sudden it's raising our bar in terms of Absolutely. what we have to put out. And then at that, at that same moment, figure out, okay, what's the back end? Uh -huh. But you know, that's what I think all of our jobs right now is to kind of figure out how to target content for consumers and go wherever those consumers are. And the, End of conversation. And that's yes. the only and I think, you, I think it's very important. We have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with our subscribers. Uh -huh. If you don't like what you're watching on Netflix or if you're not impressed enough with what you're watching on Netflix, you just one-click cancel. Right. And you can't do that with anyone here. And so that does make a, we have to make noise. We have to, sure. we are part of our business mandate here is right, we're making event television and it ain't cheap. It's not a cheap thing to do. So we have to take those big swings every once in a while. And you're not, we're not competing, you know, against uh, ABC sitcoms. We're, not com we're, all, we're competing against Pokemon Go. <laughs> we're competing against the, you know, $200 million blockbuster movies. Uh, we're competing in a, in a really noisy world for attention for some of these shows. Well, and and, and I think bringing Baz Luhrmann to television yeah. um, is, and, you know, I think there was a, a lot of press around whether or not like this runaway budget. It wasn't, we knew going in that when you work at, make a Baz Luhrmann production, <laughs> it's not going to be cheap, but it's gonna be spectacular. But you and just we said that you, you spent six billion this year, or, yeah. and you said you're gonna go higher. Where is the ceiling <laughs> yeah. for Netflix budgets? It depends on the subscribers. But the subscriber numbers have slowed. At least in the U.S., they have grown. They've they grown, they, but the, but the rate, rate of growth rate of has slowed. The, uh, it's a law of big numbers. Right. So of course the rate of growth was slow, but it, we we're continuing to grow at a very healthy pace. It was a, a, a miss of a forecast in a quarter, but in a in a very healthy growth quarter. But, but is there a ceiling? So, uh, it depends <laughs> on what you think the ceiling is for Netflix. I mean, in terms of how many people will be Netflix members around the world, uh, because uh, um, when Netflix, when you join in uh, Netflix in Mexico or the U.S., it's the same revenue pool, and we're programming to the. And when you're making programming like this, yeah. Baz Luhrmann movies are wildly popular <laughs> in all over the world. In, yeah. in in Korea and Japan, where American movies haven't uh, don't always do that well, Baz Luhrmann movies do. Right. Um, so there is a method to this, and so I think the the. The content budget is a direct reflection of the subscriber base. Point, Do you guys point, have point, when, point. when you're when you're trying to negotiate with talent and, and they know what these two guys can pay? Oh, it's a headache. How, but how do you convince people to take shows to your network? Well, I think it's a, a lot of it is the stories that people want to tell. You know, if you're Michael Hurst and you're telling the Vikings, and then you want to tell a, a drama about um, the Knights Templar, we make a lot of sense for that, mm -hmm. and they want to know who's seeing it. They want to know that they're speaking to a specific fan base and a specific audience that you know they're making their craft and their stories for. The so you don't have 120 million but you can offer no, the and audience. And it's not only just an artist is, problem. Is, is, every, it's is everybody here knows, just spending a lot of money. Doesn't mean it's great television. Correct. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Is absolutely no guarantee. Now this Tell may end up, that. this may, <laughs> this may, this Baz Luhrmann thing may end up being uh, a, a super hit. Um, but more is not better, right. only better is better, mm -hmm. and yeah. we've had a lot of successes with shows that have been mid-range budgets, yeah. and um, some shows where we've spent more money haven't landed I as well as we hoped that they were going to land. Right. And most so, of our unscripted fare rates higher that's than right. most yeah. of the scripted fare <laughs> on all of television. Especially, especially now. So it's, right. yeah. it's a... The lure for us is what we call symphony, yeah. and AMC does it in that way, and A&E does it in their own way, where we can offer a producer, uh, an entity, right, it's not only going to be on a USA, or we may cross-platform mm -hmm. a USA and a sci-fi, but you're going to get promotion across the entire portfolio, meaning NBC, in the parks, everywhere we go. So the attention to a show, the possibility yeah. of marketing, yeah. is something that we can balance yeah, out, but awesome. if I go here, they're going to pay me that much. Yep. So it's the attention, it's the marketing, it's the hand-holding, and the freedom we will now, uh, we have learned to offer some of our producers and our writers. I think we're going to continue to see that if you want to do an independent film, which we finance and make, yes. we made Boyhood, you probably don't want to deal with a studio because they're not going to write checks for 12 years uh -huh. as you hang around and watch uh -huh. this kid grow up. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. And you'll get Boyhood. <laughs> and I thought it was brilliant. Yes. It, was, yeah. it was rough at year six. So um, are we still doing that? Uh, but, but in all seriousness, they're not going to do that. And so you see these independent films emerge, and they take on a world of their own. Yeah. 
and a life of their own. And then you see certain material perfectly adapted for different platforms that's and it flourishes. Yes. And just when you think it's static, and just when you think the thing that's not working or yeah. is under too much pressure because it doesn't have the affection, smart creative people, they can be executives or creators, figure out that there's something to do that's entirely enticing and novel. Yep. So I do think that's going to also influence money and form and creator's disposition. We're going to get pitched something in, in a few weeks that I, I, I know just from the log line is going to be very expensive. Yes. <laughs> but what, what I can tell you I know we're making yeah. going forward are, are not our highest budget uh -huh. projects. That's not by design. That's not because we've come in and said we're not going to spend over this or over that. It's because that is the vision of the artist who's come in. Parenthetically, there are people who have come in, like Steven Soderbergh, with digital ideas, yeah. which sure. he would never have even contemplated two years sure. ago. So yes, he wants to continue the Nick, but he's equally passionate about another project that's purely digital focused. Same with John Stewart. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Same did yeah. you did you learn? You mentioned you know money doesn't always equal quality. Absolutely. What did you most learn from the vinyl experience? Listen, I think what you learn from the vinyl experience is that you can have an extraordinary array of talent in one place. Preternatural director and artist in Marty, a showrunner with a brilliant track record like Terry, and it doesn't land quite the way you hope it's going to land. I've never the, seen that. Never yeah, that, 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 that's, that's, that's just that's just to quote Hyman Roth. You know, that's the business we've chosen. Yeah, that's the business we're <laughs> how do you make that decision? How do you make that decision and, and, the, and that timeline of that decision? To renew well, it. You don't and make then a decision to fail. You don't no, no, make no, a decision. decision. I mean, I mean, you, you make it to go I, in I, and I, fail. You make it to renew it, and then you make it to say, you know what? Yeah, listen, I, I think this doesn't make sense. we we took a look at where we were. The fundamental question on the table is, could it be great? Mm -hmm. And you have to answer that very coldly and very honestly. Not could it be better. Mm -hmm. But can it be great? And if you come to the conclusion that it's going to be a better version of good, and given what we've just spent 45 mm -hmm. minutes talking about, which is how high the bar is, something of a target on the back yeah. of that show, a lot of talent around it, which is, by the way, the other side of dealing mm -hmm. with people um, who are sui generis, who are that big. Yep. And we collectively just made a decision which was uniform in the company. Let's move on. You know, those are hard decisions, those are difficult decisions, but that's what we get paid that's to do. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. I want to turn to Roots. By, before yeah, we move off, of, I mean, uh, um, in the same vein of budgets don't always drive yeah. grandeur, grandeur the, uh, I mean, the big surprise for most people has been Stranger Things this yes. year for us. And these are brand new filmmakers, uh -huh. the Duffer Brothers, had one feature before this. 32 and years old. 30, and uh -huh. just brilliant yep. visionary t TV makers with a cast of complete unknowns. Uh, Winona Ryder and Matthew Modine <clears throat> compliment them, but these kids are out of nowhere. Yep. Um, I just saw them the other night, and this is, you know, they're a couple of weeks into their fame, uh -huh. and they are <laughs> out of their minds. They're 11 yeah. and 12 year old kids who are, whose life is just completely turned upside down. And they're like, all my social media followers are from yeah. Brazil now, uh -huh. you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, but it's a good example, I think, for every Baz Luhrmann, yes. for every David Fincher, uh, the exciting part is when there's a Duffer Brothers that emerge. Absolutely. New stories. Or a Benny Off and Weiss, by the way, who never did a thing on yes. television. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, just to add to that, that right. cap. And just it's not, I guess, often referenced, but the woman behind the night manager, the director, yep. is Suzanne Beer. Yep. My favorite beer. She's director of all right, time. She's I love her. Yeah. So great. She did every episode too, which yeah. was shocking Crazy. to me. And mm -hmm. so she is in Copenhagen, and she's d did Brothers and uh, a movie yep. we distributed, and then other really wonderful movies, pretty much independent films, and and then does this, and it's really gorgeous. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Susan so, so directed yeah. one of the most like in our very earliest days of streaming. We couldn't really get any movies because yeah. they were all sold to HBO. <laughs> and, uh, Still but, most sold to HBO. <laughs> <laughs> but um, o Open Hearts was uh, it was an independent film that went out. It did done real in the box office, yeah. great reviews. I happened to see it at Sundance yeah, and fall yeah, in love yeah. with the movie. And Bob Bernie brought it to us and yeah. we wound up putting it on Netflix. And yeah. It was awesome. It was yeah, just, yeah. She's a great filmmaker. She, she's a, did she's an amazing thing with Night Manager. All right, so and, I wanted to yeah. mention I'm the sorry. Roots piece because obviously that that's one of the things that mm -hmm. was part of the Emmy conversation now. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping you can sort of take us through the sort of value proposition of doing a project sort of as expensive but also as high profile and has, as gutsy as that is. Does it need to be profitable? Is, is that the goal of something like that? Or is it about awards and sort of how does that sort of pie come together for you? Look, at, you know, it's, it's always a little different. The equation for yeah. every show is a little different. Um, Roots happens to be profitable already, but it's not why we did it. Uh -huh. um, you know, we are an organization that tends to 
gravitate more to swinging for the fences when we are going to take a big bet mm -hmm. like that. And I'd rather fail spectacularly than fail quietly. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to do it, let's let's do it. Yep. And look, for us, it was the 40th anniversary. There was a historic element to it. Mm -hmm. We greenlit it long before the Black Lives Matter conversation heated up. Uh -huh. So you know, there was a we got caught in a little bit of a cultural moment um, at the same time as really endeavoring to do something that we thought was important storytelling. Yeah. It came together because I don't remember it. I was too exactly. young. Exactly. Two, two and so I said to everybody, this was a cultural moment in television yeah, yeah. and yeah. I don't remember <laughs> it. Yeah. And so there's a million of me out there. Let's do it. Yeah. And and that's really sort of how Sorry. it came together. What deserves added praise is you take on an iconic piece yeah. like that. Yes. All eyes are on yeah. you. I did know we couldn't and, screw up. And <laughs> you, did, you, did, you not only you not only didn't screw up. In we a, had that in, with Full House. In, <laughs> <laughs> and you honored it. Yeah. Yeah. My children were not disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, yes. you you elevated it for another generation and the you did something important. Yes, oh, really, thank the you. swinging for the fences piece. The the other one you've done of late in, in recent months was was Viceland. That is one where I think there was a lot of people sort of ready to pounce on. Yeah, I mean, look, not on what it was. Not in, only do we have to find great shows and great creative, but we're also tasked as you know as executives, not just television people, with finding new models for our businesses mm -hmm. and ways to expand. Um, you know, Viceland is part of a broader initiative where, you know, we're part owners in Vice proper. Mm -hmm. And so it was, a, it was a bigger conversation. I mean, indirectly, Richard and I are in business Absolutely. together. Absolutely. And, and I think that's where the business is going. I mean, I think if we were to all come back to this table 10 years from now, you know, our businesses are going to look very different. Yeah. We're going to be partnering differently. We're going to be selling to each other. We're going to be using our brands differently. And you know, not only do we need to to swing for shows on behalf of the audience, but we have to swing with business ideas and strategic ideas to make sure that the next generation of creatives have you know a completely new imagined or reimagined way of having their product seen. You know, you guys are indirectly in business together, but then you've got a mm -hmm. sister company, CNN, Jeff Zucker, <laughs> saying, you know, look at these Viceland ratings, they're horrible. Yes. Uh, yeah. How do you yeah. reconcile that? I mean, let me say two things. First of all, they're doing with Vice exactly what they should be doing with that piece of the brand, and we're doing with Vice exactly what we should be doing with the public affairs and news side of the brand because that's where we started with them. The show did very well, it got a lot of traction, and what we said to Shane was, let's design a daily news show again to the digital optionality yes. that we wouldn't have had before. Designed for millennials <coughs> with a particular voice that tries to bring some intelligent context to an unbelievably complicated world. They and we hired somebody of Josh Triangle's breath and intelligence to be the executive editor of that. And I think we're going to do something important. The, the, the street talk that goes back and forth between them, I actually find, you know, a, a, a little bit silly. Jeff's doing brilliant work at CNN. He's elevated the network. The proof is in the pudding. You must be so thankful for Donald Trump. They're ready. They're ready to web. Um, so I think, again, to my earlier point, there's room for everything. Of course, but Shane, has said, for Shane has said that he didn't tell you guys about the vice yes, president. He, he did. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And Bill Simmons. No, 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 not yes, only. Not, no, 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 no. Absolutely. No, 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 no. We drew a very clear demarcation when we were talking about vice land, and and I asked a very simple question. Do you have the time and the focus to do this? Do you want to do this? And if so, can we demarcate what's here at HBO and what's going to yeah. be on the Viceland network? And we carved it out very simply. Public affairs and news is going to be on HBO, and then everything all, all, else, is, everything on else is going to be on Can we on ask how, I mean, how, from a ratings perspective, <clears throat> we know what, what Zucker thinks of it, but from where you sit, how is it faring? I mean, it's yeah, why would you give your ratings? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you mine if you tell me yours. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's doing exactly what we set out to do. It's garnered a couple of Emmy nominations for a three-month-old channel, mm -hmm. <laughs> which mm -hmm. is really the goal. It was to attract an audience that's not watching much TV, which it's doing. It's been growing every week, and the ratings are going to be public soon enough. But we're trying to pivot the conversation away from just purely a ratings exactly. conversation. Well, yeah, in, defense of, in defense of swings, <laughs> if I may, uh, almost a sure sign of a great future entity is some attention in the birth canal when everyone jumps up and down and says, no. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, yeah. no, no. 
they're often competitors. Yep. That's yes. a good sign. Yep. That yeah. suggests that they're yep. sort of paying attention. Hence concern. Just indifferent. Yep. Hence concern. And yes. so you can go through, and I could tell, I could tell you our own tales of who said what when, yes. why are you doing dramas that cost too much and you can't monetize uh -huh. and you'll drown yeah. your company yes. early on, followed by who are you going to be when Breaking Bad and Mad Men go off the air, uh, you've got nothing, that's your identity and your destiny. We know something Followed about by that. all those series <laughs> of questions, in all seriousness, but the, 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 the Viceland, by the way, personal opinion is it's spectacular and its voice is really true. And it will be not only sustained but fully redeemed. Mm -hmm. and I really believe that. But, are, but also, the sign very, of when you swing, yes. generally, there's some chorus who's course. probably. Course. Course. I, I know how to put ratings on that channel. That's I take some of right. my programming right. and I move it to that <laughs> channel, and it has ratings. And we, but we've made a very specific decision to be pure to the brand yep. exactly. because brands matter. Exactly. Yep. The easiest thing in the world is for somebody to come in the room and tell you why something won't work. Yeah. Happens yeah. every day. <laughs> yes. And so ultimately, to govern is to choose. You're going to make the decision. There's never a guarantee. It's way more yeah. easy to say no. Exactly. Yeah. Way more easy to say we no. all get the question, how do you pick? Like, That's right. I, th oh. I think one of the challenges for all of us, too, um, is how do you refine and grow a brand as audience age out? Yep. Because the brands may be targeted not just a certain demo, but a taste of that demographic, mm -hmm. and yet you want to stay pure to your brand, but as the millennials age into it and the 50-somethings age out of it, there's a lot of risk in doing that, and I think HBO, I know we have on USA We're and Sci-Fi, right getting now. to yeah. that place with Bravo, not so with E yet, where we have to make change and we have to take some risks, and we have to stay true to the brand, but make a sharp left or right. And I think that's the hardest thing in terms Mr. of- Mr. Robot is in many ways- It is a sharp left turn, but people didn't know we took some baby mm. steps that weren't necessarily rating successes, but started planting a little bit of groundwork. Right. We did political animals. Yeah. That was kind of dark, it and it was, was. edgy, dark and for it the was Blue Sky Network. Yeah. That, that's exactly yeah. right. And we took a couple of middle swings that we were very proud of, but it was like, what are they doing? And it took such a strong left turn, at which we took a big risk on because yeah. when we read the script, we thought it was brilliant. You know, I'm sitting there giving notes saying, I love it, but how are you going to deal with all that voiceover? How, what are you going to see during all that uh -huh. voiceover? But we knew that it could be very indie and die dead, but the critics would probably like it, and so we experimented, but we were willing to take the risk. But go, is, that a I mean, is that a model that you can replicate? Because the, the, the ratings piece of it, you ha you've gotten that critical attention, you've gotten the Emmy Awards, and it has sort of changed the perception of the brand yes. in a really important yes. way. It is not the commercial hit that a lot of those blue skies. And the same is true for Unreal. Right, right. You but can look at Unreal the same way. Yeah, but this is a discussion in terms constantly. of life same yeah. versus the reality of aggregating eyeballs. Mm -hmm. And we have not gotten to the place where we can aggregate who is watching that where, whether you're dealing with VOD, SVOD, every single platform that that, that, that is on. We'll yeah. have in a week from now, as best as we can, the aggregation of everyone who's watching it. And it's pretty damn huge, but it they're not big. watching yeah. it live same. Live same to live, you know, L plus three is one thing, to L plus seven is different. It's 126% yeah. difference from L, but it's LS also to But managing L3. a portfolio. I mean, Bonnie and, and, and Josh, and we have uh, large portfolios. One show isn't going to crater any of our networks, and, and you're making a decision based on a portfolio of choices. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you but have it, your high and your low. You it have, is interesting, yeah. like a show like you just described, the better monetization for that show would probably be subscription, right? Because L3, L7, L30, L60, L150, L, all those, uh, they're not monetized equally. Mm -hmm. So when you start aggregating the audience, you can't say, well, so, yeah. in, in that, and that's why one of the things that we're, we think why I'm trying to disconnect ourselves from all those different mechanisms is that it's equally valuable for me if somebody watches Bloodline season one the week after season two same, launched same as, yeah, two but, years ago. But, but we also have value in ad sales. Yeah. Yes, you know, you take is. a yeah, look yeah. at what Robot has done for the cachet of the channel at yeah. large yep. Yep. and yep. those wanting to be in it in spite of what that live same number yeah. is. And it just creates, a fr you, you can't buy what the halo has done for USA. Are we mm -hmm. going to do everything that dark? 
No. <laughs> no, and we also have international business. I mean, we're yeah. in, you know, yeah. 200 countries, so right. Roots is traveling globally. Unreal right. is traveling globally. That's, you know, we're a very U.S. centric, you know, point of view here at this table well and as yes. a country. Well, and you know, that's not how we're U.S. Right. rating data point doesn't matter. Doesn't, and, and, they don't it, care. But it defines, but outside of the U.S., yes. it, you don't want that as a negative when it doesn't matter yeah. to that country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Marco Polo is one of those shows for us. It's usually popular all throughout Asia and Europe and. Uh, and it's a lot of focus on whether or not my, your neighbor's watching it right yeah. now. And it's really irrelevant. It's really, it's doing exactly what it was supposed to do. Uh -huh. Because, Lacey, what's curious also is, I think if you're in the jobs that we're in, you're paid to look at what's happening today, yeah. next week, next year, and time beyond <laughs> uh -huh. as well, because the businesses will go on. There wasn't streaming subscription a very short time ago. It is now, look how predominant it is in our lives. And so streaming subscription, didn't exist a few years ago. It's brand new, relatively, and it has all sorts of monetization opportunities. Yeah. So when you evaluate a piece of content today, it's particularly if you own it, mm -hmm. um, it's probably misguided mm -hmm. to take a time frame that's very short. Yep. And because you're going to blow it, and you better have the right time frame in your evaluation uh -huh. because you'll be heroic for a week, and you'll basically trash an entity yep. for a month or three years, yeah. so so the world really the, the consumption patterns move with sh lightning speed, right. and so it's really good, especially if you own. I mean, that's part yeah, of the parcel of the evaluation. Yep. Oh no, no, yes. but if you do that, which we all increasingly do, we set up AMC Studios. We now have 15 shows in production. We own all rights. That evaluation changes yeah. everything you look at, and it's actually it's slightly difficult to formulate and identify value over time, but it's very true that the winds suggest that there is, as Richard demonstrated when he talked about The Wire, which by the way, I've come to admittedly terribly late, <laughs> and so I'm on, I'm, I'm actually no now. spoilers. Yeah. No spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned the OTT piece, and Richard, Richard you uh, gave some <laughs> subscriber numbers a few months ago. Can you give us an update on where the HBO OTT not, numbers are now? I, not without creating um, a, a tremendous <laughs> amount of concern inside, <laughs> That's inside, what we would like you inside the IR community of Time Warner, other than to say we're obviously very pleased with the progress of, of our OTT um, business as it grows and improves and evolves. Look, for us, OTT is just another option for the consumer to get HBO. We're going to continue to grow our business with our cable subscribers, with our satellite partners, with our telco partners, and I hope that they will come increasingly to bundle HBO in their broadband packages. And then we have another option, obviously, which is streaming, which mm -hmm. Ted uh, and, and Reed introduced to the world. And uh, what you see is you just want to be available in any way that the consumer wants your product. And in this crowded world, people want curated quality that they can trust. We own our own programming. And because we own our own programming and have owned our own programming as a model throughout the modern history of the company, when we license our programming into 150 countries around the world, apart from our 60 networks, now adding a new dimension of OTT in Brazil and Spain and Mexico, we're now finding all kinds of different ways to monetize the brand. We're not monetizing a specific piece of programming when we do a licensing deal mm -hmm. or an output deal or a home of HBO deal. We are monetizing the brand and what people obviously come to expect when Sky buys all of our oeuvre, they're buying the whole panoply yeah. of HBO quality. Ownership is going to give you the flexibility to be able to react, whether it's more global, whether it's Absolutely. a different technology, whether it's a different platform. It's the fan who's attracted to the brand wants everything that's associated Absolutely. with the brand. Yeah. So it's not a replacement. We're not seeing an either or. It's I love my Lifetime movies. I want it on Lifetime. I want it on Lifetime movie channel and I want it on my Lifetime movie club. There's no question it's it's better economics and there's no question it's better optionality. Is that something you consider? I mean, well, going we, forward? we do both. They so do. But, but but you still are licensing. Yeah, and the reason we continue to is I think the danger of mandating ownership yeah. is then you really narrow the universe of things you're going to do. Yep. Um, Universal Television makes Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt and Master of None for yeah. us, and I, I, I'm glad that we didn't walk away based on ownership religion. Um, and I, well, I would like to own all of our shows just so we can have that fun, that that optionality. But what you don't um, want, to don't, degree, right. is you don't want 
to have all the brand cachet around House of Cards that you have, Absolutely. and then find out that it's on Canal Plus in France. You you want to have that for yourself well, because okay. that speaks. I definitely agree that was true at the beginning when we didn't own all the territories and we, then we launched in those yeah. territories later <laughs> and we don't have House of Cards. Yep. Uh, it's a, a lot of brand confusion. Yep. So I definitely want the global access to those brands. So then we have to do the, d the debate back and forth. Do you want to go back and buy up those territories uh -huh. or do you focus on but the next from, House of but Cards? But from yeah. the beginning going forward, you yeah. agree it's a better thing than not so. to own your country. For sure, yeah. Yeah. for sure. And but we what, have yeah. to because you know, we're eighty percent of all of the shows we're doing right now we're doing at UCP. Yeah. And it's to be able to have that flexibility. If the ad dollars aren't coming in quite the same way, we're not a hundred percent sure of what's gonna happen with the affiliate world mm -hmm. as all slim packaging <laughs> happens. Mm -hmm. That we have to be able to do whatever we want with the content. We have to be able to produce it for different in different yeah. formats, whether it's digital, whether it's VOD, yeah. S V O D, et cetera. And the only way you can do that is to own well, and also the, the TV everywhere environment where you're streaming your channels, are greater you have to have. Right. There is the question, if I'm sitting here as, as a writer or a piece of talent, what is going to be my back end at, at a Netflix? Or does it not matter because you're paying me enough up front? That, What's this, what do you say That is why the them? checks are so big, because we are, we're, we're, we're negotiating a, you know, a, a back end for what the back end would be. Would be. But the back end, but there is not going to be one because it's going to stay. But you're now getting I, into second, third, fourth, fifth seasons of shows yeah. where talent expects <laughs> to be paid more and creators expect in, to be in paid more. In many cases, they are paid more. They are paid in, up front for that because the, we when we talk to agents, be. that's the yeah. complaint they have about Netflix is that the, whereas in a traditional environment with syndication and other revenue streams, the ultimate payday on a huge hit might be lower at Netflix. Uh, I bet not. And, uh, and ultimately, if you look at the, the, the cancel rate and the, re uh, and the renewal rate of this last season, you'd see, if just, if, just if you factor in that as a discount of some kind, you'd think that you're, you're done very well by yeah, your That's client. assuming a big hit, but you're right. Exactly. And so you're, you're talking about 99% um, you know, of the output of, you know, for the 1% that's going to break out. So I do think that you know, it, it is in those deals. We do buy those out, and we don't choose to license the content off of Netflix to others. Um, because I think most of the value of that content is wrapped up in the exclusivity on Netflix right now. Yeah. Um, do you actually and it, watch, that may change down the road. Do you actually watch all the content that is on Netflix, it all is, the original programming? You yeah, I do. Possibly. You can't possibly. I do, but it's the heartbreak is I don't get to watch it as it's being made every time anymore. There's too many things now. We have a, this month we have a, a, a documentary series called Fearless uh -huh. about the Brazilian bull riders. It's unbelievable. It's the kind of thing that I, in the old days I would have loved to have been involved in every shoot and every cut of that thing and you just, I, you can't You watch every episode of Fuller House. <laughs> I did. I watched, <laughs> many, I watched a few of them taped. So, so. But, but, as it, but I, as it, I, th I think our goal here is that we're trying to make the best version of whatever that is. So even if it's not for me or not for you, it's the best version of that. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you have to have some touch. But more importantly, you have to have an amazing team. And it's Cindy Holland, who heads up our original content team, and, she and, I, and she's built out an incredible team. And my management philosophy of this team is that they're going to do what I would do if I had time, 85% uh -huh. of the time. And I have to learn to live with the 15. Yeah. And I really have to live with it. I can't. It's very hard. I, I can't beat him up if it goes the other way. I can't say I told you so. All of us were in that role at some point. Exactly. But staying yeah. current. Ted, Ted touches on important. Staying current with all our stuff, yeah. just all our stuff, is enormously time consuming. <laughs> and uh -huh. I know everybody around this table is uh, is is also healthy neurotic, so they're watching early cuts. Yep. And I'm watching and your stuff. They're You're following up. <laughs> I mean, we're reading I'm, for I'm God's sake. I'm fans, as I I'm said at the podcast. beginning, <laughs> uh, of, of everybody. So I am watching. Yeah. Um, it's borderline other, taking the joy out of television. It has. Other, <laughs> other people's work, and I and I will tell you, add to that our reading, add to that, yeah. um, you know, those of us who who are who are news junkies. I get less sleep. I'm yeah. sure the worst you thing do. about and, the um, lifetime merger was do. I knew the Project Runway. Yeah. Aww. I was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. How much time do you spend with watching the analytics? Do you have a big dashboard and say, oh, this show's popping, this show's yeah, popping? Yeah, I mean, we get I get a daily read on how everything's mm -hmm. going, and then it compiles. You can go back. So and tell us really some of the tell us yeah. some of the numbers. Between us, just between us. Yeah, and I mean, I watch it obviously. I'm, I run to know: Do these shows <laughs> pop? Do they grow? Mm -hmm. uh, at what point in the curve does this show surpass the other shows? What's something surprising so. we may not know about the consumption habits? Of these shows. Well, one is how global they've been. So, I mean, there, we have markets where uh, U.S. television um, doesn't travel as well, that we're doing really well with our original programming and our globally licensed shows. Uh, if you look at certain, there's some big hit shows in the U.S. that are not sold outside of the U.S., and you go into those markets and they become usually popular. 
we, we bought Breaking Bad in the UK after it was canceled in the UK. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting kind of preconceived notions of what is and what isn't. Uh, obviously, the Breaking Bad wasn't a worse show in the UK. <laughs> it was just on the wrong channel at the wrong time in a very linear, you know, uh, system. So we were able to do that. So I just think the the, the thing that's most uh, interesting all the time is not what's different about each market, it's the similarities of sure. them. And I will tell you, Japan is tough. There is no habit of watching yeah. U.S. content that's in true. Japan. We're, we are getting some breakthroughs on our shows. Uh, we're producing shows in Japan, we have five original shows what, that we produce. What's huge in Japan? Uh, we have a show called Hibana. Do you want to talk about niche? Um, it is set in the world of uh, Japanese manzai, which is a form of stand-up comedy. That uh, if you got five feet out of Japan, you wouldn't know anything about it. Uh -huh. uh, but it's a, based <laughs> on a very popular book, um, and it's done really well for us. We produced another original show there called Terrace House, uh, which is kind of like a teen Big Brother, and it's hugely popular and being watched all over the world. So when we do these originals in local language in all these different countries, uh, we're also making them available globally. Yeah. So it's always really fun and to it see bears, them break It out. bears noting. All of our indigenous programming outperforms all of our American-based programming. Huh. And so you have to be mindful all the time that while everybody is excited about seeing the kind of uh, collective of the HBO uh, library and, and of our yeah. current programming, when we make shows in Latin America and we make shows in Asia, they outperform our shows. And if you looked at, if you just went into, if you went into England, for example, and you looked at the top 75 shows in, in England, they're not American shows. Right. Yeah, British, British, yeah. Pro, British yeah. They're yeah. British programming. So Japan yeah. is hardly an anomaly in that regard. It's 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 a more it's a particular example the, of the, the absoluteness point. of it's the, the absoluteness, absoluteness of the. Point. All right, final exactly. question yeah. in. Two to three years, how do you think your businesses will be different? We've seen a lot of mergers lately. We've seen Stars and Lionsgate come together. We've seen you know, changes in consumption habits. We've how seen do you, rumors of Rumors of rumors collaborations of or spin-offs or such things. How will your business be different in two to three years? I think we're going to continue to figure out the best way to streamline internally so that as we did this past year, creating all development for scripted, kind of, kind of coming through one tunnel, so it's one-stop shopping. Similarly, you know, we're trying to figure out how to do that with um, reality, which is a little different because sensibility is different. I think we'll have a lot, I'm hoping that we'll have a lot of adjacent businesses that will allow us to play in the digital world with sell-through, with more social coming in. So we're not dabbling in digital that has nothing to do with our lifestyle networks, but they are adjacent businesses that connect through. Um, we have one deal we're very close to right now with Priv, where connected to Bravo, NE, et cetera, we'll be able to play in all kinds of formats but really work with the brand and the business for what it is digitally, for what it is in terms of luxury and business and clothing, et cetera, but also connect that to our linear business. For you, 12 billion a year in content? <laughs> <laughs> in what's your time frame? Two years. Three years, three years. <laughs> yeah. I think what happens um, for us over the next couple of years, my job has not been the same for any two year period <laughs> since 2000 since I joined. But what, what I think the big, most fundamental shift is going to be um, the volume of original production that's going to be happening uh, for Netflix. Considering we're, we did almost none in three years mm -hmm. ago, just flash forward three years from now, and um, we probably will be producing more original programming than any single source, any single <laughs> network, any single studio globally. So um, that's a big shift. Do you see Netflix yeah. buying a content studio? We'd rather build it than buy it. All of our delivery technology is everything about the company is really built internally. That's no off the shelf anything. So I think we that is kind of in our DNA to build it instead of buy it. So yeah. how about you return? Options. You know, continuing to press on um, options for our consumers, working with our current partners to bundle and create win-wins with different forms of distribution. Um, for us, we think it's very multifaceted, right? So if Comcast is an example, wants to package us in their triple play, that's great. If they want to package us in basic plus, that's great. If they want to put us in a skinny streaming, that's great. If they want to put us in their broadband only bundle and upsell into a cable bundle, that's great. What we've built over the course of the last two, three years is the flexibility for our partners, both in the ecosystem and in the new digital ecosystem, to market and sell HBO in myriad different ways. We're going to continue to press on that advantage. We too are going to make more and more programming. 
And I think one of the things we did not talk about today that bears mentioning, which is 74% of our viewing across all platforms is Hollywood movies. Mm -hmm. It is astounding when you see the numbers on those movies mm -hmm. across all platforms. Is that true of Now and Go as well? Absolutely. And it's quite stunning. Mm -hmm. And movies that did not necessarily perform yeah. so brilliantly in the box office. So, Wasn't mean, one of your biggest movies Battleship? One of, our biggest, one, of our, one of our biggest movies, I mean, John Wick and We're the Millers and Fast and Furious 6, and, if, and, and these, well, I'm talking in the 32, 34 million numbers over a period of time. So we want to continue to have our movie advantage. And then globally, I think this is very important, adding the new option of OTT for us and continuing to grow with cable penetration around the world is going to help us build our international business, which is currently about 25% of our revenue, and I think you're going to see that grow uh, over the coming years. All of this undergirded by one simple thing, curating great quality content. Will you have the same boss? Owners? <laughs> I think so, yeah. We like, we like flying under our <laughs> own flag, that's right. Fantastic. All right. How about you? You have guys have something quickly and then we'll wrap I'll, I'll up? I'll try and make it quick. Yeah. I think I'll try and say it because these guys have said it well. I think <clears throat> we will be more global. Mm -hmm. We spent a billion dollars buying channels around the globe. I have my channel back here. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll be. I keep asking. Think, He's like, no. <laughs> I think we'll be more global. I think we'll own more intellectual property by producing it ourselves and developing it or purchasing. We will develop more facility to go direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll be thought of or think of ourselves increasingly as content owners, manufacturers. I guess that means we have to walk and chew gum. <laughs> At the same time. <laughs> Nancy, will you, will you, will Andy have the same number of networks in the U.S.? We'll have fewer? Will yes, I think we've already done an amazing job at culling our herd and sort of saying we're in the business of you know, brands and we've picked our brands and these are our ponies in the race, so to speak. Um, I think the way that we think about our brands will evolve. You know, I think about history as a category and we have to own that brand, not just on linear television. It has to be owned as a label that expands to, you know, all types of different storytelling and products. So, you know, thinking about our brands more holistically and I think the way that we create programs and the way that we curate shows is going to change dramatically. You know, we have to find ways to access different voices um, to help us tell these stories and not keep going back to sort of the same well that we're all competing in and maybe even being able to control our own destiny in terms of the fast turnaround of shows and being able to tell stories on a spectrum that um, I think you're also going to see the clock for linear channels change dramatically. You know, we're already playing with a little bit of that, that I mean, there's really loads? no reason why we have a clock. <laughs> and that, you know, a show could be 10 minutes, a show could be seven mm -hmm. minutes, a show could be 94 minutes. Um, and we just need to tell the stories that need to be told. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're really experimenting with how do we push that forward. I, I know you're running out, yes. but if I could just one more, if I get the, uh, what you had mentioned about movies, that's why I wanted to come back to movies for a second. Because I think one of the, the byproducts of this golden age of television is that it really has come at the, at the cultural expense of movies. Absolutely. Where people are most likely sitting around dinner talking about yeah. the shows they're watching instead of what movies they're seeing. And that's why I'm, I was curious about it because people, but people love to watch movies. Yeah. And I think um, what <coughs> we see is. On their connected TVs and their television yeah. sets. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't think yeah. they're abandoning movies because I think what they're, um, why, why TV has taken this dominant role I think has been the distribution models are so much better and so much yes. more consumer friendly. So when you give the opportunity to watch movies, and we have different flavors of it in every country, in Canada we have a lot they of do. we have a ton of mm -hmm. output deals, yeah. but they all watch about a third and about 70 30 TV movies. Hmm. So about 30 percent of all watching is movies, and I think that they are the most still on Netflix. Yeah, and I would say that they're the most ridiculous windows that we're getting them in. When people are getting get, are excited about a TV show, there's 50 different ways they can watch it. And when they yeah. excited about a movie, they sit around and twiddle their thumbs for 10 months until they can watch it on Netflix or HBO or somewhere. That's so well, that's why and we move so quickly and, 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 yeah. and yet, interestingly, and again, this our movie usage yeah. on the network is higher now than at any time yeah. in history. Huh. And the stickiness, meaning the repeat viewing right. of those same right. movies, is higher than at any time in our history. But that's what yeah. motivated And that's how we were born. Yeah. That, that, that's the best way we could influence the window. Even Adam, even Adam Sandler? Adam Sandler <laughs> Adam, the two Adam Sandler movies premiered at number one in every single territory of Netflix around the world. 
the do-over is still in the top ten in nearly all of them. It's enormous. He's enormously popular. His films are enormously popular. It's been a hugely successful deal. Um, he, he's got another one. We're starting production next yeah. month called Sandy. Uh, that it's you know, and, and the thing the thing that is most global on Netflix mm -hmm. is Adam Sandler. So in, long in Japan, live Adam Sandler. Yes. Thank oh, you guys so much. Thank you. We've always wanted to end this. Adam Sandler. Always end this. Absolutely. <laughs>